Hello, everyone. Welcome back uh, to this webinar. Uh, today's webinar is about uh, BLISC machining using SolidCAMP's five axis functionalities. Uh, today's webinar is a bit special because uh, uh, this webinar is not going to be using, or rather, I'm not going to be using in this webinar uh, any automation tools to machine this BLISC. And uh, we are going to use some very nice. Uh, cutting tools, uh, the roughing and uh, finishing, especially uh, with the bull nose and the barrel mills are going to be from Tegutech. Whereas the final finishing towards the bottom where the uh, barrel mill or the bull mill cannot reach, we're going to use the uh, taper ball nose tools that are basically solid carbide end mills uh, uh, just to finish very small areas of the, uh, of the entire uh, blade. So let's begin our uh, uh, our presentation and uh, sorry it's not going to be the blisk demo i was wondering why i got slide number six here so we are going to be using this one uh, let me swap it okay so let's begin our uh, session let's begin by understanding first what is a blisk Basically, BLISC, a blade integrated disc, is a type of an advanced or turbo machinery component that combines the functions of a rotor disc, the, the one, the round thing in, in the uh, cylindrical part at the bottom, and the blades are attached to it to form a single part. They're not welded or they're not uh, you know, assembled, but they are part, it's a single part. There are primarily two areas where uh, BLISCs are used. One, in the aerospace industries. Uh, BLISCs are commonly used in aircraft engines. Now, if you have, uh, if you have the, uh, what I can say, if you have ever been to uh, any museum displaying the aircraft engine, the section of the aircraft engine, uh, the ones that you see in the front that is visible to your naked eye, even when you're uh, uh, trying to go up on the aircraft or coming down, when you look on your left or right, whichever side the engine is, uh, it starts with a BLISC. But the real blisks are the ones that are behind that particular uh, uh, the rotor blades. We call it rotor blades so behind that. So they are commonly used in uh, aircraft engines where they offer several advantages over traditional assemblies. Uh, now, back, I think about eight or 10 years back, I had the privilege of visiting one of the uh, companies here in uh, India. They make, uh, they make, gas turbine engines, and this is for power generation. So there, uh, they make uh, separate blades, and it has got, uh, still people do that, it has got the uh, Christmas tree uh, base, and that gets assembled onto a ring. So that's one uh, way of making it. The other way, one is, of course, the integral part itself. So the integral part offers several advantages. Uh, over traditional assemblies, including reduced weight and improved efficiency and lower maintenance costs. In the power generation industry, BLISCs are also used in gas turbine plants where they play a crucial role in energy production. The primary role of the BLISC is to convert kinetic energy of a working fluid into a mechanical energy that can be used to drive a generator or any other equipment to produce electricity. So these are the two main areas where uh, BLISCs are commonly used. Now, we know about BLISCs. Let's know about why it's a challenge to machine these. The picture that you're seeing on the screen of a BLISC is probably, uh, I would say, on the simpler side of, uh, of BLISCs. There are even more complex twisted blades on the, on the BLISCs. Uh, for the sake of the webinar, I've picked up this part to show you how things can be done, but the entire process and functionalities, they more or less remain the same irrespective of what geometry of BLISC you're trying to cut. So there are challenges in machining BLISCs. A, the geometries are complex because primarily because they are integral, that, that's why they are complex. They are integrate and often uh, they have the asymmetrical blade designs that require precise machining to, uh, to achieve uh, desired shape and surface finish. The geometries are pretty complex and that's what makes them difficult to machine using the traditional methods. The 
precision requirement is very high. I mean, the quality requirement as far as the uh, dimensions and other things are concerned is very high. Tolerances are very, uh, very tight. And these, uh, dem these requirements of BLISC's demand advanced machining technique. Your machining should be such that you should be able to control every point on the toolpath very, very well. Uh, either automated or manually but in both the cases the control has to be very much tight in order to get the kind of tolerances uh, and uh, precision that is needed and obviously to achieve a very high precision in blisk machining it requires a sophisticated cam system and also cutting tools and let's not forget especially when it's come with, when it comes to using barrel tools or circle end mills the machine also plays a very very critical role in in the movement so if you have an old machine which is not willing to move smoothly then you have problems using barrel tools on such machines so the machine also plays a super critical role in this entire process and most of the uh, blisks are always made with difficult to cut materials like titanium or nickel based alloy like uh, in Kunal. Obviously, we can't use uh, the end mill kind of a tools to uh, solid carbide end mill kind of a tools to uh, work with them because uh, the inserted cutters offer a great deal of uh, uh, efficiency as far as the insert design is concerned. They are specially made for machining really tough to cut materials. Today, we are going to uh, use some tools. I'm going to uh, shed more light on the tools that we are going to uh, use. These are traditional tools that you find them in, uh, in the uh, shops. We are not going to be using any sophisticated uh, uh, solid carbide end mills and stuff like that. Traditional tools we are going to use to machine the, uh, or machine the blisk. Now comes the part of the cam. So we have solid cam here and remember that in this entire uh, demonstration of uh, of the BLISC, I'm not going to be using any kind of automation. We have automation for multi-blade, we have automation for port, we have automation for multi-axis roughing, we have automation for edge breaking, we have automation for edge trimming, we have several automations inside. In fact, a little bit smart way is to use the automation of multi-blade and machine the blisk. It'll do it just like that. But that means you need to have the multi-blade module with solid cam inside with you. So this whole webinar, we are going to be using only the generic five axis machining, which is the standard five axis machining bundle inside uh, or module inside solid cam. So solid cams generic five axis milling is the most tested and proven five axis engine. It's been around for the last 20 years now more than I, I think shared over 20 years that we have this particular engine with a very user friendly inter interface. We have worked uh, very hard on this interface to give you a very uh, uh, easy to uh, look at and easy to work with user interface, which uh, conforms to the uh, to the user interface we have in the other areas of solid cam like turning, Milton, 3D milling, 2D milling, etc. So the user interface follows the similar similar structure that we have for others. So if you are a user migrating from three axis to five axis, it's very easy because the user interface looks absolutely familiar to what you have with three axis. And the most important thing is we have uh, advanced collision checking and control over the entire tool path. The user gets complete control over the entire tool path. He can machine the part the way he wants and make the machine move like the way he Want. So everything is controlled by the user. Each five axis machining strategy provides sophisticated options for leads and links and tool axis control. So we have got vast varieties of <coughs> tool axis control. We also provide automatic collision avoidance strategies that check the part against both the tool and the holder. It also detects pot potential collisions between the tool workpiece, tool holder, and automatically adjusts the tool path to avoid collisions. So we have got strategies in which it can avoid collisions. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, one very, uh, uh, I would say, very rarely used strategy by users of solid cam, but it's super powerful. Uh, and I have to admit, I learned it only a couple of weeks, weeks back that it could do something I never imagined it, it would do. Uh, also, 
the solid cams generic five axis milling includes a very realistic machine simulation absolutely essential when you're doing complex paths which allows for visualization of the entire uh, machining process so you can run with or without the material removal and it will show you exactly how the machine axes are going to move if there are collisions let's say between the tool and any of the part of the fixture or the spindle touching any part of the fixture or the part all these are highlighted by solid cams machine simulation even before you take it to the machine since i also uh, rather i'm we are going to use circle end mills let's look at some of the advantages of circle end mills and why they must be used in machining uh, parts like uh, blisks or impellers for that matter uh, what are the advantages primarily there are many advantages but if i group them three major advantages are basically first one is reduced cycle time circle end mills have very large radiuses for example the tool that i'm going to use is having a radius of r30 on the on the major uh, part which is almost like using 60 diameter ball nose uh, on the entire profile okay so you get the advantage of getting a high or a large radius it allows a bigger depth of cut or side step to be taken without compromising on the scallop height which probably you would have to take very small depth of cuts when you're using with ball nose. Let's assume we would like to have a, a two micron or three micron scallop. And with the ball nose, we are able to, we need to take about 0.1 to 0.15 depth of cut to get that particular scallop. With a barrel mill with, an, uh, with a radius of, let's say, R30, the same thing jumps up to 0.7 to 0.8. I, I can increase my depth of cut. So straight away, my machining time is going to be or i'm going to machine the part at least five to seven times faster because of the uh, depth of cut and side step that has already increased by about six times if you have a possibility to use the solid carbide circle end mills then in that case the parallel tools have a much larger radius in some cases they have r80 so it's like using diameter 160 tool where i can even go with a bigger depth of cut in such cases the machining can become 10, 10 or 12 times faster than the conventional machining using ball nose. Uh, the other uh, uh, important aspect of using circle end mills is improved surface finish. The circle end mills uh, are designed with a large radius on the cutting edge, which helps to achieve a smoother surface finish. When you try to use small diameters, you can always see those marks on the on, on the surface, but those marks disappear the moment the radius of the tool increases. The marks are there, but they are never visible to the naked eye. So they are so small or so faint that it's impossible to tell where the marks are. So the large radius distributes the cutting forces more evenly, reducing the risk of tool marks and chatter. The last line that I just explained about the cutting forces actually contributes to the third point, and that is the stability of cutting. Circle end mills, first of all, have large diameter and shorter flute length compared to traditional end mills, which increases their stability during cutting. This feature reduces the deflection and vibration. Even if there is a deflection, remember, the deflection will happen on the large radius, okay? So even if there's a deflection, the tool will still be in contact with the, uh, with the part on the same radius. So the chances of getting marks or chatter are bare minimum when you're using circle end mills so i believe uh, we have uh, got uh, enough uh, information about what we are going to see uh, let's straight away run into the uh, into the product okay so let's uh, minimize and i'm going to start solid cam going to open the uh, part <clears throat> okay so i have this part uh, already mounted on a fixture and the fixture will be then mounted of course on the machine and then that's the machine how the machining is going to start i also have my stock which is a a turned stock okay so we're going to have a turned stock where i'm going to mount the turned stock and we're going to do the uh, machining of, on the of the part on that particular stock. So as you can see, 
I have nothing in my process. So we either are going to uh, define the process or I'm going to use one of the most uh, uh, powerful features available with SolidCam and that is the drag and drop templates. So I'll go into my template manager and I have the Blisk machining process template ready with me. Okay, now I have made this template in such a way that if you have a geometry which is more or less similar to this, may not be exact, more or less similar, it will work like a charm. It will work on any of this on any of these geometries, <clears throat> which are more or less similar to the part that you see on the screen. It may not have the same dimensions. It may not even have the similar shape. The twist can be more or less, but it still will work on the part. So I'm going to drag the process template and drop it into my uh, into my process, uh, cam manager. And that's the coordinate system. And I have my process that is already now in the cam manager. So I have got the roughing, that there's a semi finishing. Again, there's a roughing. Uh, and then there is another semi finishing. And blah, blah, blah. So we are going to do all that. So <clears throat> we are going to start with the roughing. And the tool that I'm going to use here today is this particular tool called Chase for Feed from Tegu Tech. So it's a 12R.5 high feed bullnose tool. <clears throat> Maximum depth of cut allowed is 0.5, both on on uh, on either titanium or in Kunal because the insert is meant for uh, nickel alloys. So we're going to take about 0.5 millimeter uh, depth of cut on that. And the of course, the parameters suggested by Tegu Tech. So this is the tool that we are going to use today on our part. Uh, so let me edit this uh, process. <clears throat> okay, since I'm using the second monitor, this jumps into there. So this is my uh, tool path. We are using morph between two adjacent surfaces. Geometry blank because we are going to define the geometry ourselves. So the drive surface in this case is going to be the bottom surface. So these two pieces of surface is going to be my drive surface. I'll accept it. We're going to have four cuts, max, num maximum number of cuts are going to be four between the two blades. And we are going to start the cut from this particular surface. And we are going to end the cut on this particular surface. So it's between those two surfaces that I'm going to prepare the tool path. The tool, like I said, we are using a Tegutech 12R.5, and this is how the tool will look like. Okay. So it's a 12R.5 with uh, those inserts there, and it's a high feed bull nose. Okay, let's accept this. Levels uh, currently, since it's coming from the template, I'm more or less comfortable with uh, the kind of retracts that we are going to get. We take it to the imaginary cylinder, 230 uh, millimeter radius. In the toolpath parameters, my maximum step over <clears throat> is 0 0.5, uh, sorry, point, uh, 5 millimeter. We're going to use a zigzag uh, method, but however, the cut order is going to be from the center and away. That means it will take the first pass in the center and then it will move towards the blade. Okay, that's perfect. Tool axis control, simple. There is nothing. It's going to be at pointed normal to the bottom surface. Very simple tool axis control. Uh, leads and links are again coming from the template. We are using lead and link, the automatic leads and link. Let's go to the gout check. And this is where the most uh, funniest part or most interesting part comes up. So I'm going to, I would like, the tool to go in as much as possible and stop when we reach a clearance that is two millimeters. The holder must be away from the surface by two millimeters, and that's when I want the tool path to stop. Beyond that, it should not machine. So to use that, we have got a function in gauge check called as stop tool path calculation. Now, I must admit all these years, I thought stop toolpath calculation means the toolpath calculation will stop and I won't get a 
result. Uh, I learned it from my own people that when you use a stop toolpath calculation, it actually stops the calculation of the toolpath. No more further slicing is done. And whatever slices that were generated are linked and presented to the user. So we are going to use this particular method here. And I'm only going to check the holder and arbor with the check surface. Now the check surface in this case uh, will be the top of these two blades. That's all. We don't need any other check surface in this case. I'll accept this. Let's go to roughing and more, and I'm going to switch off the rotate and translate. I will explain to you later on. First, let's look at how the toolpath comes up. Save this, and let's calculate this toolpath. Remember, I'm doing all of this right in front of you. Okay, there is no movies going to be played. I'm doing all the calculations, the part, everything is in front of you. So you can see that it is taking up 120 slices, but not all 120 slices it will be able to machine because of the collision check. Right, so we have the first toolpath between the blade. And if we have to run the simulation, let's run the simulation using uh, solid verify and look at how the uh, uh, simulation looks like. Okay, so that's the uh, fixture and the stock. And let's start. So first cut in the center, next one on the side, next one on the side, retract again, goes to the center, side, side. So we said four cuts at the most. So it's only taken three cuts, one in the center, one on the side one on each side. So this is how it's actually going to rough. And remember that we are not using a ball nose tool here, but we are using a bull nose. A bull nose tools are the most complex tools when it comes to five axis. They are very difficult to calculate, okay? But you can you can look at how SolidCam is managing this particular, uh, uh, handling the tool axis of this particular tool with, uh, with all the complexities involved. Okay, perfect. So I have the uh, tool here. I mean, I have the toolpath. I can edit this toolpath. And I will go into rotate and translate. And I'll select the rotate and translate. We need 34 uh, blades. We have 34 blades here. And it's the angle is going to be 10.5882. So that's the total angle. And let's run the calculation again so that I get the entire uh, toolpath. Now, it doesn't run everything again because it already has the toolpath. All it does now is to just run the rotations. Okay. It doesn't reslice or do anything of that sort. It just does the uh, uh, rotation. And now it's going to present the toolpath to you. <clears throat> okay. So that's the toolpath. So I have the roughing and you can see, although I had asked it to go all the way down, it just stopped here. The, the collision check, which tells us that uh, stop toolpath calculation is actually stopping the tool or preventing the tool to go below it, which will cause collision. All right, so what I have here is I have only scooped out the center. I can tell you because I've seen the simulation of the part. So I'm going to have some material remaining on the corners here, which obviously I'm not being able to rough. So what I'm going to do is instead of doing that, I'm going to use a semi-finishing operation with the same tool. It's just going to run around the entire blade, remove about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and keep only 0.3 millimeter for my final finishing with the barrel mill. So I have the semi-finishing here with the same bull nose tool. And I'm going to show you another trick that I learned. Thank you very much to my, my team down here in India on the geometry selection, how to select geometry when you have too many surfaces to be picked up. So I'm using, again, morph between two adjacent surfaces. And the drive surface obviously is going to be one of the blades, okay? 
so i will click on new now if it was one or two surfaces i could have just picked it straight away but remember there are so many small small pieces out here and picking the surface is a pain okay so what i'll do here is i'll go into cad selection and i will select sorry we have some other problem here just a moment i'm just going to save this sorry okay let's go to here cad selection and i'll select the surface and i'll click on select neighbors so it immediately selects all of the surfaces but it's not done i also need to select the bottom fillets because that's the pain area for me right now to select the next set of surfaces i'll click on select neighbors again so it takes that surface and then starts selecting the neighbors now if i had more surfaces i'll click the select neighbors again and it would select all the neighbors of the adjacent surface so i have selected all my surfaces that i need and i'll resume and of course i don't want the top surface so i will unselect it accept it and my start edge surface is this one because we are using north between two surfaces here and my end edge surfaces are these two surfaces perfect and in the collision check again we are using the same uh, mechanism stop toolpath calculation uh, with the holder and arbor so as much as possible it should go inside since i'm going to go around this particular blade it makes sense to select these two surfaces also because we would like to check against those two surfaces because my holder is large going to save save it and calculate of course here i'm going to do the uh, i have already kept the rotation of the entire blade as it is that's done that's pretty impressive so that's the calculation again you can see here it's not gone completely down it just stopped here because this is it beyond this the holder comes into play okay so this would leave about 0.3 to 0.4 millimeter of material for my final finishing with the uh, with the uh, with the barrel mill right now we have done our roughing and we also did our semi finishing but in both the cases it has still not gone all the way down we still have material here now in order for us to remove that material we obviously now cannot use that bull nose tool because it's short beyond that it cannot so i'm forced to use a taper ball nose tool with a much larger uh, length much longer length and obviously we, we will not be uh, uh, going ahead with this going with the same parameters or same step over things can things will have to uh, calm down a bit we have to reduce the side step we have to reduce the feed rate but the amount of material that it is going to remove is pretty less so we are good good to go with it so i'm going to go again to the uh, tool path which is exactly the replica of the first tool path and i'm just going to pick the geometry here so let's go to drive surface okay the drive surface again is the bottom surface i could have picked the same one but I always prefer to have more geometries. So I'm going to start with this surface here and end again with uh, the surface adjacent to it. So it's going to be between those two surfaces. The tool that we are going to use here, you can see is a taper ball nose. It's a 12 uh, taper ball nose tool with 3R at the bottom, okay? So that's the uh, ball nose, uh, taper ball nose tool that we're using. Uh, tool axis control again nothing changes like i said it's exactly same as the previous one collision check okay stop toolpath calculation so we are going to use the same mechanism here select the two uh, top surfaces that's where my holder will come and stop and obviously because we are using a ball nose tool i don't want it to go and touch the side of the tool so we're going to tilt the tool if there is a collision so i'm going to use again those two surfaces this one and this one where it will tilt if there is a collision between those two surfaces done 
and that's all. I'm going to save it and let's run the calculation. The machining principle remains the same from center is going to go away. So the first slice will be at the center and then it starts moving left, right of the blade side. So we've got a very nice tool path. You can see the very first cut that is going to come in the center. It's going to create a groove like thing and then keep expanding that till it reaches the side of the blades. This is completely collision checked. So we are not going to have any issues as far as collisions are concerned. <clears throat> so we now know that we have removed the material right down up to the blade. Still, it's not ready for finish because we still have some material on the front and side. So we need to run the same semi finish that we did earlier, but with the taper ball nose tool. So I'm going to use again this particular. I've just copied the second tool path, pasted it here, changed the tool. Okay, so we will change the name here as taper ball nose. Okay, in the geometry, <clears throat> again, we use the same trick, CAD selection, select the top and click on neighbors, click on neighbors again, and then we have the, oops, sorry. I did not click on resume. You have to click on resume in this case. Select neighbors, select neighbors, resume. And we will unselect the top. We don't need that. <clears throat> uh, again, morph between adjacent surface, so the top surface and the bottom surface. That's done. And I have used the limit between two points here. So we don't need to do anything. Only thing now we need to do again is the uh, collision check. And in this case, I want <clears throat> the, the tool path calculations to stop moment it detects the collision with the bottom surface. Stop that to the next one. And we are going to tilt the tool with the drive surface. So if there's a collision with the drive surface, all these surfaces, it will tilt itself. Save it and calculate. Somebody's asked me if I can verify or you can show the solid verification of the taper ball nose. In a moment, I'll do that. Let me finish the calculation. Okay, so this area was not semi finished, so we have done that. We're now ready for our finish with the uh, barrel mill. Now, <clears throat> the barrel mill tool that we're going to use again comes from Tegutech. And in this case, we are going to use what we call as the S feed barrel from Tegutech. It's a modular tool with insert on the on the side. So we are going to use the diameter 12, which has got three inserts on the side. Uh, and we are going to use the 06 insert, which has got, I think, R30 uh, on the side. That's that's the large radius that it, it gets here on the side. On the side here. So it's going to be about R30. So the parameters here are like, we are, we are going to take a depth of cut of 0.7 millimeter on every pass. Okay, so let's uh, go back again to our uh, finishing. Somebody is asking if we can receive the recording. I'm sorry, I'm answering the questions as they come up. Recording of the webinar, yes. The web, when the webinar is done, within 24 hours, you'll get an email with the link of the recording. It'll be a YouTube link and you can watch this on YouTube. Okay, in this case, again, the geometry, <clears throat> but we are going to use slightly different mechanism here. The drive surface uh, in this case, again, like CAD selection, pick this, select the neighbors. I'm not going to select the uh, radius. It's not needed in this case. Let's unselect the top. We are going to use uh, two curves now. The method that we are going to use is uh, 
morph between two curves. So that's uh, the first one. Okay, and then we select the bottommost curve, which we are going to use as the second curve for our morphing. So I'll select the edge, uh, direction, okay, continue. We don't need to select, we can just click forward chain method and it will keep chaining itself. Okay, done, 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 no. Yes, so we selected also the bottom bottom chain here. And the tool that I'm going to use, I just showed you that we are going to use a barrel mill here, which is, uh, I think this is R20, sorry, not R30, but R20. So it's like using a diameter of 40 ball nose on this particular, uh, <clears throat> on this particular blade. Uh, we are going to be using a 0.7 millimeter depth of cut that corresponds roughly to about two microns scallop on the uh, on the uh, on the surface. Tool axis control is very important because you are using a circle end mill here. <clears throat> we are we can't use the angle method when we are using the circle end mills uh, inside solid cam because you can't specify an angle. But when you're using a circle end mill, all you can do is you can specify the contact point on the barrel shape where do you want the contact to happen so in this case i have selected the barrel uh, section here first selected the contact point then i selected the barrel section and i said the contact point should always be at 75 percent of the barrel so if we look at the barrel the bottom point is zero and the topmost point is 100 so you can imagine where the 75 percent will be i can also specify that it can start at 75 and probably end at 30%, okay? So it will keep changing the tilt angle to maintain the contact point from 75% to 30% of the barrel shape. I can do that, but today I'm going to just be using the 75% constant uh, uh, contact on the shape of, on, on, on the blade, shape of the barrel on the blade. Collision check, <clears throat> again, like I said, we, I'm in love with the stop toolpath calculation, so I'm going to pick the top three surfaces. Because the tool is going to move around, these two surfaces are going to come into play, especially when the holder is involved. Okay, it should just stop. Second one with the bottom, it should again stop the toolpath calculation. If it finds a collision with the bottom surface, stop. I'm sure it'll not go down, but this is just a, a uh, a safety mechanism that I've built in, and we are going to rotate this tool path 34 times. Save this and calculate this tool path. Calculation is done. <clears throat> we'll see the toolpath preview. Perfect. So let's run the simulation of this and see how it looks like. So what we are seeing here is 75% of the of the contact. Okay. We can look at the contact. It's exactly at 75%, it's not 100%, okay? So <clears throat> with the barrel mill taking 0.7 millimeter depth of cut every time it goes and machines it, we are going to have a very fine scallop remaining on the, on the, on the, on, on the entire blade. So what would have otherwise taken 0.1 or 0.15 millimeter depth of cut, we can safely achieve that using a depth of cut of 0. Uh, uh, six or 0 0.7 millimeters. So we are we are hastening the machining by at least six to seven times. Let's assume that that would take uh, one hour. This will take less than 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to machine this particular part with a barrel mill. And all of this with complete collision control and all the user control that one can get on, on uh, in solid cam for machining 
these kind of uh, structures using uh, the barrel metal. All right, <clears throat> we know very well, first of all, what you're seeing here is the tip of the tool. So my radius is going to be, or the contact point is going to be much above. So we know, I know for sure that this entire blade cannot be finished using the barrel mill. There will be at least some 10, 15% of the area that will remain, which needs to be finished, not with the barrel mill, but with, with maybe a taper ball nose, only that small portion, okay? So that's exactly what we are going to do. I'm going to machine only the bottom area here with the taper ball nose. Again, pretty simple. <clears throat> so we are going to use a parallel to curve functionality, drive surface, uh, again, cat selection, pick the surface and I'll select the neighbors. And in this case, we are going to use also the uh, fillets here. Oh, sorry. I didn't click on resume. Select neighbors once more. Oh, um, I don't know why I'm making this mistake. Select, resume, and unselect the top. We don't need it. Okay, so those are my surfaces. And as you can see, I'm trying to explore all the possible strategies that I have inside SolidCam. So we saw morph between two curves. We saw morph between two surfaces. Now we are saying parallel to curve. So I'm going to pick this particular uh, edge curve at the bottom. Okay, and let's use the forward mechanism. Not here, this is not the right. This one is the correct one. Okay. As long as my arrow is straight, it's going to go and merge. Okay, accept it. So that's the curve. And the cuts are going to be parallel to it. We are going to use about 35 cuts to reach. Again, we're using a taper ball nose, the same one that we used earlier. Tool axis control. Now the tool axis control here is a bit tricky. Because we are using the fillets at the bottom, I can't define an angle because then I'm going to have a very crazy tool path. We can't be using any kind of uh, angle, but I'm going to use what we call as a curve. I've already created the curve and I will show you how to create the curve. Now, this is one of the advantages of having a integrated CAD CAM. You have got the CAD sitting right next to you. You can move between CAD and CAM at, at, at a click of a button without having to change any environment or anything of that. So I've created this particular uh, curve. Now, how do I create the curve? So let's do it on some other surface and I'll show you how this curve was created. For that, I simply right click on the part here and click on edit. And now I'm in the SolidWorks CAD environment. No, and you, you can see that nothing changed, but we are into the CAD environment. I go to surface and I offset this particular face here. You can see I created an offset surface at 10 millimeter. You can have 10, 15, depending on how you want the tool orientation. For me, 10 millimeter works well. So I create this particular surface out here. Okay, once I have the surface, of course, I can't extract this edge. I'm, my tool is not going to be uh, correct. I need to extend out this edge. To extend this edge, I'll again go into rule surface in SolidWorks, and I select this particular edge, and I'll say tangent, 12 millimeter, and I'll keep picking the other edges. So I create the surface here. Okay, I accept it. Doesn't end here because the edges are still not really very tangent. So I'll go to three, 3D sketch and I'll convert the edges of the surface and then use a function called as fit spline. Select this entire one and give a very liberal tolerance of 50 so that I get a much uh, smoother uh, spline, delete the geometry, select OK, and we are done. So now if I switch off these two surfaces that I'd created, I get a very nice 
curve, which I can then use to guide my tool to machine the blade. So this is exactly what I did to get that particular curve. Okay, simple. But for that, you need to have the CAD environment right next to you. I'll exit, come back to my solid cam uh, environment. And in the tilt control, I will pick this particular tool. Okay. And we'll use the closest point uh, method. That's it. Let's look at the gout check to be checked against the check surface. Now, these check surfaces are basically these two surfaces. I don't want any collision against these two surfaces. So if there's a collision, it will tilt the tool in, in a way to avoid the collision against these two surfaces because I'm machining the center blade. <clears throat> and also, uh, the bottom surface has to be checked. That's it. There's nothing else. Save and we'll run the calculation. That's it. So you can look at the toolpath. It was complete. It's completely machined, including the fillets. So it, the fillets also have been taken into account when it's machining. So up to here, my barrel has already finished it. Beyond that, only I'm machining a very small percentage using the taper ball nose. <clears throat> now that we have finished the uh, machining here, our only uh, area that is remaining is the area at the bottom, what we call as a floor, to be finished. Again, we are going to use a taper ball nose. But again, method here that I'm going to use is going to be different. So I'll edit this toolpath, and here we are going to use a mechanism or a strategy, which we call as parallel to surface. I'm trying to use as many strategies as possible so as to show you the power of solid cams five axis. So we're going to use parallel to surface, the geometry in this case, okay, now again, I'm going to use this nice method that I learned a few, few weeks ago. I'm going to select <clears throat> these two surface by pressing the control button and I'll say find the neighbors, find the neighbors again. Well, selected the surfaces, we'll resume and I'll unselect the top surface, I don't need it. And we are going to just generate one pass here. I'm going to switch off everything else. And I'm going to just generate one pass. Collision check will be done uh, with the side tool tilt with the, I mean, if there's a collision with the drive surface, the tool will tilt. And of course, it will also retract if there is a collision with the bottom surface. So it will retract up till it finds no collision with the bottom surface. So these are the two collision checks that I, I'm using. Save it. Oh, sorry. Edge surface, surface to which the cuts will be parallel because I said parallel to surface. So those are the two surfaces. Save it and let's run the calculation. So we are going to get not a complete result, but we're just going to get two passes. So <clears throat> what it has generated <clears throat> is just these two passes. One and two. Now, in order to finish the floor, I simply have to go to roughing and more, go to a function called as area roughing, switch on area roughing, decide what is going to be the step over between the passes in between these two blades. <clears throat> trim the cut if needed and apply the calculation after the collision has been applied to the two blades. Okay. And we will use a zigzag method. Save this. I'll run the calculation. Okay. So the calculation is done and this is how it's going to machine the floor. So we used some legal tricks available within uh, solid cam to first generate the area and then to machine the area in between these two slices. Now, this particular method can also be used to do roughing. How? 
pretty simple. I said number of cuts one. If I say number of cuts 10, and if I give the spacing here as uh, three mm, okay, you can see what it'll do. <clears throat> so I said 10 passes and it's precisely doing 10 passes. So I can actually use this method also to do roughing. Okay. So it's not that you can only do finishing, you can also use this method to do uh, roughing. Uh, Paul is asking, how did I get it to recognize the rest material? No, it did not recognize the rest material. I got or I uh, switched on the first tool path, found out the point, and I precisely uh, mentioned that particular point as a starting point for the next tool path. It's done manually. The software did not recognize it. Although it's a very good, uh, very good feature uh, request, which I can talk to my development and see if we could recognize it. Although I know that this can be done, but currently it doesn't have the capability to recognize it automatically where the previous tool path ended, at least in five axis. Okay, so uh, we are done with the tool path calculation. Somebody asked me, please show the simulation. So they would like to see the simulation up to the uh, next uh, <clears throat> toolpath, but I, I think it's going to take a lot of time. So let's simply start running the simulation. Going to solid verify. So uh, more or less, we have completed it. And if anybody is interested, uh, if you, you need to have solid cam for that, of course, uh, once the webinar is done, we will send out, of course, the, uh, the recording. But if you go to our website on solidcam.com and under webinar recordings, you will see this recording and on the side of that, if you're registered, you'll be also be able to download the parts, the machine, and most important thing, the templates, okay? The templates that I used here, because you can use these templates on any Blisk. You might have to do some minor modifications, but more or less, they're all good to go, okay? So not uh, very, uh, I mean, it's not uh, highly secret, uh, it's not a secret thing. It's just that it's there. <clears throat> so any other questions, if you have, you could ask me and uh, I will try my best to answer the uh, questions. So it, you can see that it is machined as much as it can all the way till the time the holder comes in contact. It doesn't come in contact. It keeps two millimeters gap between the stock and the uh, on the holder, and then it stops. Uh, if you want to download this material along with the uh, video, you can go to our website, solarcam.com. And uh, in solidcam.com under webinar recordings, you should be able to see this in the next 24 to 48 hours. The recording will be available. And also the parts that I use today, the project will be available uh, to download along with the uh, templates that I have created for, for machining this. So you don't have to define anything. You can just apply the templates, just drag and drop them and just reselect the geometry and you should be good to go. Uh, somebody is asking me if there is a solid cam training in South Africa. I think there is a solid cam training in South Africa. Uh, I don't really uh, remember exactly uh, the name, but uh, I have your contact, so I will definitely send you an email with the contact of the training center down back in South Africa. All right, if uh, there are no more questions, it was really a pleasure hosting you and showing you the capabilities of SolarCam uh, 5 axis for machining blisks. Uh, in the near future, uh, I will be again uh, doing a webinar on machining uh, closed impellers, okay? Not the open impeller, open impeller is, uh, it's nothing, it's very easy. Uh, closed impellers, and uh, I'll 
I'm working on that part. So once the part is ready, I'll be hosting another webinar uh, for the closed impeller. And I'll show you how closed impellers can be done using uh, SolidCam 5 axis generic. Again, remember, I'm not going to be using any automation in this. I'm only going to be using the generic 5 axis to show you how different paths, industrial paths that are there that can be done using SolidCam 5 axis. Uh, where can we find the BLISC template? It will be part of the webinar material on our website. So along with the project, you'll also have the BLISC templates. Uh, the name of the YouTube channel, it's under SolidCam. So you can directly go for, uh, uh, you can visit SolidCam uh, as a channel. I think it's SolidCam and I machining. That's the channel. But you don't have to worry about that because the uh, the link that you're going to get after the end of the webinar will have the link of this recording. So you can watch the recording after the webinar is done. All right. Uh, will we receive an email? Of course, I have all your contact details. You'll be added on our uh, on our uh, on our emailing system. So whenever there's a new webinar, I think there's a next webinar. I'm not conducting it, but somebody else is hosting it next week. Uh, we are going to have that particular uh, uh, webinar also. You will be added onto our email system, and you will automatically get this particular email for attending the webinar. Right. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I believe I've answered all the questions. Uh, if you if I if you still have any questions unanswered, you can always get in touch with me. My name is Amod Onkar. My email ID is you can get in touch with me on my common email ID. It is info.india at solidcam.com. I N F O dot I N D I A at solidcam.com. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye bye.